Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Well, let's pray. Lord, I thank you that you want to deliver your whole church yes. from all kinds of demonic strategies. Yes. Spirits of religion and spirits of anti-Semitism. Yes. Spirits that want to prevent the gifts of the Spirit of God from being released through the body of Christ. Yes. And spirits that want to seek to prevent the return of Jesus. Yes. The book that I have written, So Deeply Scarred, is a compendium of historic events perpetrated by the church against the Jewish people in the name of Jesus. You can get a copy of this book from our website. Those of you who are here at this conference today can get it at our ministry table. So I have two opportunities to share with you, this session and this evening session. And what I want to do tonight is kind of give you a prophetic spiritual background of how the Lord brought me into this aspect of our ministry and um, kind of underline for you the fact that there is a prophetic call upon all of you to rise up beyond where you are and take the things that you're learning and activate them in your own life, in your own church, and to other churches. We are none of us called to be hearers of the Word of God, but all of us are called to be doers of the Word of God. Yeah. So all of the things you've heard today and all of the various resources that are available to you are to equip you for service, to equip you for action. And I just want to encourage those of you that have been speaking today, those of you that I've met here in Tulsa, to really um, grab hold of the anointing that God has given you and to, uh, to pray into the word of the Lord, that prophetic word that God is releasing to you, and to stand against the lies that want to minimize you in your own mind, to tell you, who are you? You're not. You're just a little person. You're just one person. Those are lies intended to stop you because the enemy knows how powerful and influential your voice can be. Because you can touch one life who can then go on and touch thousands of lives. And you can touch hundreds of lives that can touch hundreds of thousands of lives, whether it's locally or nationally or internationally, using the internet, using YouTube, using putting your teachings online. And when the enemy tries to minimize you in your own mind and says, well, nobody will listen or it won't be important or it won't be good, that's a real call to you to get active in doing it because the enemy knows just how the opposite is the truth and how your voice can touch a person who can touch other people because I tell you, we are in a move of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. We are in a move of the Holy Spirit to restore the church to her biblical biblical relationship and responsibility to natural Israel, the Jewish people and the nation of Israel. In 1990, I had an encounter with the Lord in prayer. He woke me up really early in the morning and uh, began to speak to me and I had been interceding and praying as a Jewish believer, as a Jewish minister, about the relationship between the church and the Jewish people, about Messianic Judaism, anti-Semitism, replacement theology, and things that we had dealt with since we came to faith. And uh, I'm, I was really being deeply stirred. And many of you who are here today, or you're watching or listening to this, and the things that you've been hearing are stirring you on a deep level. And even if you can't understand what the stirring is about, be, pray into that stirring. That's what I began to do. I got a, a, the Lord had me um, just be alone with Him and really pray, praying in the Spirit, praying in tongues, being in the Word. And God uh, woke me up quite early. I went for a walk in a Jewish community in South Florida where we were visiting Janet's family. And um, the Lord began to speak to me. And you know when God speaks to you, you remember what He says. And He said these words to me. He said, Howie, I intend to accomplish four reconciliations. I intend to reconcile the church to her Jewish roots. I intend to reconcile the church 
to the Jewish people. I intend to reconcile the Jewish people to their Messiah, and I intend to reconcile Messiah to planet Earth. Yes. Those were the exact words he spoke to me. I have never forgotten them. This was December of 1990. I went to share later on with Janet the word that the Lord gave me. We went home. We began to pray into this. We began to fast. And one afternoon, well, the girls were still in school. Janet and I have three daughters and now two beautiful grandchildren. Hallelujah. And um, the girls were in, in high school at the time. And we began to pray. And she had a vision. At the same time, I had a vision. And I won't go into the details of what the visions were about. But they were warning us of the demonic storm we were about to enter into. And the Lord showed us the nature of the demons that, whose territory we were invading. And you understand that when you begin to teach about anti-Semitism, when you begin to teach about replacement theology, when you begin to uh, teach and preach uh, uh, about the prophetic purposes of God for Israel and the church, you are invading demonic territory. And those demons are not happy to see you. They're wanting to stop you any way they can. But thank God that we, we do not fight from a place of defeat. We fight from a place of victory. A victory that has already been won. We are seated with the Messiah in heavenly places far above all the principalities and powers so we fight from the throne looking down by the authority of the word of god and the purposes of god and we pray over one another we use the prophetic gifts that god gives us in one another and one of the things that as you study the church's rejection of her jewish roots you also see the church's rejection of the holy spirit and the gifts of the spirit because they go in tandem, anti-Semitism and uh, supersessionism and secessionism, fancy theological terms for, hey, we're rejecting the Jews, these are the demons saying, we're going to get the church to reject the Jews, reject the Jews, reject the Jewish roots, and reject the Holy Spirit. Once we got them to believe those lies, then they're not really the church of the Lord Jesus, they're in another religion, our religion, and we can control them. And they tell you that God is coming to deliver the body of Christ from those spirits. Amen. Amen. From those spirits. And so I want to encourage you, those of you that have been here, those of you that have been speaking this afternoon, and those of you who have not been speaking but you carry the same burden, and you're also ministering, to please never give up, never surrender, never go back, but just keep pressing in against the darkness because God has victory for all of you. God has great reward for all of you because you're on the battlefield and you're going forward and build strategic, this is for those of you who are also watching this, build strategic alliances with those who are getting the same revelation. And they don't have to necessarily be a strategic alliance in your city. It would be great to meet personally, but you can meet online, in Skype, or various ways that we can meet together and pray together. These are important things that we have to do. We have to be intentional about our relationships and the strategic alliances we have in going forward. So the Lord showed Janet and I the nature of the demonic battle we were, in, we were about to enter into. And sure enough, it all exploded around us. So when it happened, we were shocked, but not surprised. We were shocked, but not surprised because of uh, who it came through. People we had been working with, people who knew our ministry, people who loved our ministry, people who knew we were people of integrity and, uh, and people of the word of God. But the devil got inside of all of them that, because we were attacking strongholds of anti-Semitism that people didn't even understand they had because they didn't really understand the nature of it. Then if we say to them, you know, you have a spirit of anti-Semitism, or you're in, no, 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 we love the Jewish people, but they're not involved in God's plans and purposes to love the Jewish people, to testify to Jewish people, and to be involved in helping stand against the spirits of anti-Semitism that are seeking to keep, to literally kill, exterminate the Jews. That's really... The devil's plan so I began to pray into this with Janet we began studying 
And the, the, the morning when the Lord spoke to me, those four prophetic reconciliations, He opened the Scriptures to me. Because you know when God speaks to you, one of the ways you know it's the Lord that it's according to the Scriptures. It doesn't violate the Bible. It's all within pages of Scripture. And so the Lord opened the Scripture to me in, in one moment, just he took me from Genesis to Revelation and showed me those full prophetic reconciliations. And this afternoon, I just want to share one section of Scripture that became kind of the central theme of what he opened to me that morning. And I've been preaching this since the, uh, the early 90s, since uh, 1991 because we got the revelation in the end of 1990 and then moved into the new year of 1991. And I want to tell you something. That before the, in, before the, 19, the decade of the 1990s, there were very few ministries teaching about the Jewish roots of Christian faith. They were there occasionally. You'd see a professor here or an author there or a, a minister there, but they were few and far between. And, through the 1990s, ministries around the world starting to get a rest, started to get a revelation that God had a plan and purposes for the Jewish people, the nation of Israel, and Christians around the world were part of it. Yes. God began opening Romans 11. We'll talk a little bit about that. But God began opening various scriptures and stirring people to pray for Israel, to pray for the Jewish people, to get involved in things related to understanding the Hebraic roots of faith. And we were blessed to observe that. And whenever we'd see it, we would say to one another, God is fulfilling the first reconciliation. Yes. He said, I intend to accomplish four reconciliations. I intend to do it. Yes. And he started to doing what he said he was going to do. And so uh, now all these years later, we're watching ministries all over the world really involved in Jewish roots kinds of things and being coming more involved now in the second reconciliation, the reconciliation of the church to the Jewish people. And now we're also beginning to watch the third reconciliation start to get fulfilled, mm -hmm. the reconciliation of the Jewish people to their Messiah. Yes. And one of the things that's happening is what the, the Jewish scholars are calling the, the, the reconciliation or the restoration or the reclamation of the Jewish rabbi from Nazareth. Yes. Mm. You know, they, they're not at the place where Jesus is the Son of God and the Messiah, but they're coming to the place where, hey, he's one of us. Yes. He's the Jewish boy that made good. Yeah, he really did. He's got a billion people worshiping him. That's pretty good in my view. You know, and uh, so this scholarly reclamation of the rabbi from Nazareth and um, going back and looking at the fact that, you know, the New Testament in, within the Jewish world was a forbidden book because the church persecuted the Jews. So the Jewish, in the name of Jesus, so the, the Jewish people believed the New Testament was their instruction manual yes. to persecute the Jews. So it was a forbidden book. Mm -hmm. Now... The, there are moves within the whole Jewish world to uh, reclaim the fact that the New Testament is a Jewish book, which it has always been. Written about the Jewish Messiah, written by Jews, for Jews and Gentiles. And it's all about the God of Israel and His promises for the nation of Israel and then and to, through the nation to the nations of the world. So the Lord opened Psalm 102 for me as the central verse out of which he hung other verses from Genesis through Revelation about these four prophetic reconciliations. So I'm just going to kind of go through that with you this, in this session. And then when, uh, uh, as we understand the prophetic nature of the purposes of God for the church and the Jewish people, then we can begin to look at the spirit of anti-Semitism and we can begin to learn how to actively come against it, to actively expose it and actively defeat it by the same prophetic anointing that the, whole, that the devil wanted to rob from you when he took the church out of her Hebraic roots because those are anointed roots. And when the anointed roots start to flow into the body of Christ, the anointing is going to get released. Amen. 
and will be delivered from the spirit of religion and brought into the flow of the anointing of the Holy Spirit. And that excites me to see people get set free and moving in their gifts and the power and signs and wonders and miracles because it's only a people like that, a people in love, a people moving in the love of God, a people moving in the power of God are going to be able to provoke natural Israel to spiritual jealousy. When they come to meetings that we have, and they see the kind of worship and the power and miracles happen, they're going to be able to start questioning, why, is, why isn't this happening in our synagogue? Rabbi, why isn't this happening in our synagogue? Well, we're not Christians. Well, at least it seems to me we should be. Hallelujah. Because we're becoming Christians, that is, followers of the Christ, followers of the Messiah, Christ meaning Messiah, so we'll become messianic, which is the most Jewish thing you can do, is to follow the King of Israel. Amen. Amen. So I believe such kinds of conversations are yet to unfold in the Jewish world. Mm -hmm. Hallelujah. Amen. So the Lord took me to Psalm 102, beginning with um, verse 13, and um, I just want to comment to you on verse 18. Because most English translations do not translate this verse correctly. The writer of the psalm is writing the fact that these things that I, he just wrote from verse 13 <coughs> to verse 16 is about to happen for another generation. And he says, this will be written for the generation to come that a people yet to be created may praise the Lord. That's the typical English translation, a generation yet to come. But in the Hebrew, it uses the Hebrew word acharit, which means the end, the last end times, last days, or the end of a thing. And so it says, this is written for the acharit. This is written for the last days. Yeah. That is, when you see these things happening, this is a sign to you that we're in the achari, we're in the end of the age. So what's going to happen at the end of the age? These things. God, verse 13, Psalm 102, God will arise and have compassion on Zion. Those of you who are students of Scripture realize that God leaves clues in the scripture, we heard a message earlier about the riddles of God and the puzzles of God and the clues of God. Here's a clue. This phrase, compassion on Zion. So if we go back and we look in the scripture, when does God say he's going to have compassion on Zion? He says he's going to have compassion after he has judgment. He says to the Jewish nation, when he married them at, at Sinai, because you understand, that was the cutting of a marriage covenant. He said to them, if you keep my commandments, you'll be the head and not the tail. But if you break my commandments, I will judge you. I will curse you. I will scatter you to the nations of the world. You will suffer in those nations, but I will not allow you to be destroyed. And at the end of the age, in the Acharit, I will have compassion on you. So this phrase, compassion on Zion, is an end of the age statement. It's an end of the age clue. So we watch the Holocaust, the rise of Nazism, which was a spiritual phenomenon. I can't go into the, well, the, the occult roots of Nazism now, but I encourage you to study those things. It was a supernatural phenomenon. The rise of Hitler to the obscurity that he was in, to being the most powerful person in Europe and then almost the entire world was a whole spiritual, demonic move. Yes. Yes. And their plan was to kill every Jew on the planet. Yes. Not just every Jew in Europe, because if they wanted, uh, you know, if they were, their plan was to win the war in Europe, which they almost did, and then to use the, the technology of the day, which included IBM. Though some of you don't know that IBM was involved with Hitler in finding, identifying Jews to kill them. That's another thing you can, you'll, your research will show you. And their plan was to comb Europe. This is the phrase the Nazis used. We're going to comb Europe from east to west. We're going to find every Jew and we're going to kill them. That was really, as what some 
historians have said is the very reason Hitler started the war is so that he would have an excuse and a way to be able to kill the civilian populations of Europe. And he, had he won the war, he would have done it. But God said this far and no further. Hitler made many military blunders, caused the war to, uh, uh, caused them to lose the war, including the, the emergence of the uh, United States as the, uh, as the invading army to stop safe civilization and end the Holocaust. But Satan's plan was to destroy all of the Jewish people. And as we study history, we see out of the ashes of the Holocaust, the nation of Israel was born. It is my opinion as a Jewish believer, if there had been no Holocaust, there would, no be, there would never have been as a nation of Israel because the Jewish people, my Jewish people, were very comfortable in Europe. They were very prosperous and they were very comfortable. They all thought that this little madman with the funny mustache would go away and it would be a little blip and everything would go back to normal. You can remind, we, we, Janet and I have ministered in Poland many times. The Jewish people were lived in Poland prosperously for a thousand years. They named Poland in Hebrew Polanya. This is the land where Yad, where God dwells. And there were three million plus Polish Jews who were very, very comfortable there with their Hasidic academy, academies. And the only way that God was going to fulfill the word of God and said, I'm going to gather you back to your land was through war. Yes. And the scripture teaches us that. We can't go into all of that now, but as you study the word of God, you'll see that. So God says there is coming a time in history but I'm going to rise up and I'm going to have compassion on Zion. It is time to be gracious or merciful to her. The Moed, the appointed time has come. And we know that God has Moedim, appointed times, the festivals of the Lord. He also has appointed times. Uh, Galatians 4.4, 4, when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law. God said, now this is going to happen. And all of you have been walking with the Lord, have discovered appointed times in your own life. When God said, now, you've been praying, you've been fasting, you've been obedient, and then you walked through the door because you, you were ready, when, and you got to that moment, and because you were ready, because you were trained, when you got to the place where there was a door, it would open to you, because the Moedim, the appointed time, had come. Yeah. And so here we have this moment, God is saying, I'm going to have compassion, the time, the appointed time has come. So what happens at that appointed time? This is what the next few verses explain to us. At the time that God has compassion on Zion, which we understand again is an end time regathering word. I'm going to gather you back to your land, which before World War II was considered a political impossibility because there was just no way that was going to happen. In fact, it took World War I to lead to World War II to open the nation of Israel to defeat the Ottoman Turks and remove them, bringing in the British and the mandate. And I know they broke their promise, they broke their covenant, the Balfour Declaration, I understand all of that. If you don't know this part of history, you should go and study it. In fact, they're just celebrating the 100th anniversary of the, the Declaration, of the Balfour Declaration that uh, Lord Balfour and his immediate cabinet, they were all evangelical believers. They believed in the word of God and they had a prophetic understanding that one day God was going to restore natural Israel to their land, ethnic Israel, the Jewish people, to their ancient homeland. So, what, these things are happening in the, in the Acharit, at this Moedim, at this appointed time. Surely thy servants find pleasure in Zion stones and feel pity for her dust. So when the Lord opened this to me on that morning so long ago, he showed me that the servants here are the, or is the authentic body of Messiah, the authentic body of Christ. Because we are the people who are praying for God's will to be done. We are praying for God's kingdom to come. We are seeking to do His will, that is, be His servant. And something happens to the servants of God 
when God begins to rise up and have compassion on natural Israel, something in parallel happens to the body of Christ. They begin to do two things. They begin to find pleasure in her stones and feel pity for her dust. Now, you know, the Bible likens the body of Christ to living stones. And, and, and the Lord showed me that here the body of Christ begins to fall in love with the living stones of natural Israel, the Jewish people. They begin to feel God's heart for the Jewish people. Something that has not happened for thousands of years where people who were Christians had any kind of loving compassion. Oh, there were occasional spurts throughout history. Men like Robert Murray McShaney and Andrew Bonar in the, in the Scottish church in the 1830s, 40s, and 50s, they began to feel a heart for the Jewish people scattered among the nations. And there were other groups like that that had a heart for natural Israel. But it wasn't throughout the whole body of Christ. And for our, most of the church was anti-Semitic. Most of the church considered the Jews irrelevant uh, at best and uh, really to be persecuted at worst. That was basically the mindset of much of Roman Catholicism and much of European Protestantism. And so in the end of the age, God's servants begin to find pleasure in the Jewish people. They begin to pray for the Jewish people because it's a move of the Spirit of God. And it says here, and then they also feel pity for her dust. And the Lord showed me the dust is the victims of historic Christian anti-Semitism. And the church begins to repent for the sins of their forefathers. They begin to read books like the one I've written. They begin to study Jewish history. Because the persecution of the church against the Jewish people is not found in most church history books. But you've got to read Jewish history books and it's all over Jewish history books because it is Jewish history. And the, 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 the Christian scholars begin to write about this. They begin to preach about it. Ministries begin to rise up. And people begin to go, oh my God, after the Holocaust, people began to look at the, the antecedents, the reasons for the Holocaust, the natural, sociological, and spiritual reasons how did this happen? They saw what happened in the death camps and they, you know, all over the places of massacre. They began to realize, oh my goodness, this is our sin. And they began to repent. And there were reconciliation and repentance, all kinds of meetings and conferences going on in which the church was claiming responsibility, repenting for the sins of their fathers, acknowledging their guilt, acknowledging their debt, acknowledging the doctrines that they believe that brought forth such a horrific evil on the earth as, as Auschwitz and Birkenau and death camps throughout Europe. The rise of Nazism and what happened in the Holocaust. So God said, when I begin to do this, these two things are going to happen in my church. My people are going to start to love the stones and feel pity for the dust. They're going to love the Jewish people and they're going to repent for the sins of historic anti-Semitism. The next thing that begins to happen as God rises to have mercy on the Jewish people and starts to gather them from the nations. And you know what? He's still doing it. He's still gathering Jews, and many of you are involved, some of you are involved in ministries, helping Jews make Aliyah, helping them emigrate to the land. Lots of wonderful ministries are helping people come back to the land, and ministries in the land, helping people who come with no money, have no resources, and helping them find homes and jobs and clothing and educate the children, etc. So this is the church feeling compassion for Zion Stones being involved in the Jewish Aliyah, the repatriation of the Jewish communities from around the world. And I want to stand you and stand here and tell you that I believe we are yet to see a time when God is going to move through America and Britain and the rest of Western Europe to bring Jewish people back home. Amen. I don't know what it's going to take. It's probably not going to be good. 
probably not going to be good. My hope is that the Jewish people will get a revelation. It's time to leave. Normally, that's not the pattern of history. Normally, it's because we are being chased out by spirits of anti-Semitism. America is no longer our friend. England is no longer our friend. France is no longer our friend. And we're hearing, seeing that in France and Spain and the chief rabbis of those nations making declarations. It's not safe to be a Jew in Spain anymore. It's not safe to be a Jew in France anymore. And, and calling for Aliyah from those nations. And as much as I don't want to say that, I believe such things will inevitably happen here in the United States of America, which does not portend well for our country. But the other side of that is when judgment comes, the people of the earth learn righteousness. I think it's Isaiah 23. And this is the great opportunity for the body of Christ to rise up in the power and the love of God when all the things are being shaken. Hurricanes, earthquakes, floods, natural disasters, economic downplay, uh, downfalls, all of the kinds of things that everybody builds their life upon. And God says he's going to shake it, right? He's going to shake everything that can be shaken. And when, since we're on on a rock that's unshakable, we're not going to be shaken. Amen? Amen? God is able to put a table before you in the midst of your enemies. He's able to put a table before you in the wilderness. You have nothing to fear, nothing to be afraid of. God is able to feed 5,000. He can still do it today. Amen? Amen. So when all of that starts to happen, this is a wonderful opportunity for the authentic body of Christ to rise up in love yes. and power and be preaching the gospel everywhere, calling people to repentance, because then they start asking questions they never asked before. Yes. When Janet and I went through Hurricane Hugo in September of 1989, after the hurricane and the devastated all of Charleston, and we were there afterward, people were asking questions that they didn't normally ask because their lives were being shaken up. And we went out a truck and we were giving out food and clothing and water and praying with people. And I personally played, prayed with over 300 people to receive the Lord because their lives were being shaken up. Yeah. So we should not be afraid. We should not be concerned about what's coming. We should be excited because it's an opportunity for the body of Christ to rise up. That is my heart. That's what I believe the Lord wants to speak to you at this moment about that in case any of that is going on in your head. Like, oh no, please Lord, don't let it happen. And I'm thinking, Lord, whatever it's going to take, let's ride. Amen. You know, whatever it's going to take, I want to be participating with you and trusting you to whatever I need, you're going to make it happen. How many of you believe that? I believe that. Hallelujah. So, also, as the servants, the body of Christ, gets this revelation and begins to move in it, and we're watching that happen. So the nations will fear the name of the Lord and all the kings of the earth, your glory. Yes. We're watching now, since the end of World War II, more evangelism in more nations than in the history of the world. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There are revivals in China. I've heard Chinese missionaries tell us that the birth rate, the supernatural birth rate, of people being born into the kingdom of God is almost equal to the natural birth rate in all of China. Amen. You know that millions of babies are born every day in China? Well, millions of people are being born into the kingdom of God in China. And one of the indicators of the truthfulness of that is how the government is now clamping down more and more on the church in China because the church is growing in authority. The church is growing in influence. The church is growing in power. And we're watching other revivals break out. We're watching ministries like um, uh, uh, Brother Bonhoff, not Bonhoff, uh, in, in Africa. Why am I blanking? Reinhard Bonnke. We love Reinhardt. You know, and the young men who are now taking that mantle to continue sweeping millions of Africans into the, into the kingdom of God. So we're watching revivals in many, many countries. Those of you that study missions, those of you that do this kind of, you, uh, online, that you're in touch with missionaries and nations, you know this is happening. You know, we personally know Iranian believers who are telling us about all the Iranian underground churches, you know, that are, that are everywhere in Iran. And this is one of the reasons why the Iranian government is, is, is cracking down on leaders, church leaders in Iran, because people are being saved by the boatloads, you know, ex-Muslims coming to faith. And when they come to faith, you know what? They fall in love with Israel. 
Amen. All the Iranian ex-Muslims that we know, the asylum seekers in Britain, they sing the songs of Zion. Yes. I went into one of their churches, and when we walked in, they're singing Hava Nagila. And I'm saying to the Lord, you can't make this stuff up. You know? And they're, they're saying, oh, we love you and Janet. You're Jewish believers. We're your, we're your Persian, because they're not Arabs. We're your Persian cousins. And we can't wait to go to Israel and tell the Israelis how much we love them, because we are all connected to the God of Israel. Amen. Amen. So these things are happening on the earth. And when these things come to pass, the next verse gets fulfilled. When the Lord builds up Zion, He will appear in His glory. This is nothing other than the literal, physical return of Jesus. He is coming. And his coming is connected to the gathering Amen. of the Jewish people Amen. and the reconciliation of the church to the Jewish people. And this is why Satan fights it so much because he knows when Jesus returns, he's doomed. He's doomed. And he is wanting to prevent that from happening. And when he sees you, little old you, rise up in prayer and begin to pray about touching people for the Jewish nation, touching, teaching about Jewish roots, he gets really concerned, pays attention to you, and begins to say something like, who the hell are you? Don't get a friend that hells a Bible word and the devil knows all about it. He says, I'm not, I, you could really be a threat. You're a, you think you're a little nobody, but you might become an important somebody, and I better avoid you before you become that important somebody, so I have to stop you any way I can, but he can't stop us. Because he's already been a defeated foe. Amen. We, John and I have been doing this for a long time. He's tried to stop us, but he can't. No. He can't. He can't stop fight. us. Have to fight. Yeah, that's right. We are called into a battle of cosmic proportions. This is why we need one another and why we need the gifts of the Spirit. Yes. Why we need the prophetic gifts. Paul tells Timothy, wage war according to the prophetic gifts, the prophecies that we spoke over you. The presbytery, the gathering of leaders, not the Presbyterians because there weren't any back then. The presbytery is the gathering of elders. Wage war according to that prophetic word and many of you are sitting on prophetic words. And I want to tell you, go back to that prophetic word, whether it's been recorded or written down or however. Go back to that and begin to wage war according to the word of God. And if you don't have anything where prophetic words have not been spoken over you, get to where people are praying and believing and God will speak. Because it's part of the restoration of the whole body of Christ, that we flow in the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Amen. This is really important for you to understand. Jesus is being held in heaven according to Acts chapter 3, verse 21. Paul is preaching, and he says to the nation of Israel, he's showing them how their leaders rejected and killed the Messiah and calling them to repent. Because there is a Jewish culpability for the death of Jesus. Not the whole people, not the whole people for every, in every generation everywhere, which is a demonic lie inspired to, to inspiring the church to murder the Jewish people. You heard about that a little earlier. It's in my book. We talk about that a lot. These demonic lies that the devil has used to pervert the relationship of the church and the Jewish people. So Peter is standing up. And in Acts chapter 3, verse 21, it says, The Lord Jesus, watch this, is literally being held or restrained in heaven until the time for the fulfillment, the time of restoration, the fulfillment of all the things the prophets have spoken. Amen. So Satan hears that and thinks, Aha! I can keep Jesus in heaven if I can stop the words of the prophets from being fulfilled. <laughs> well, what are the words of the prophets? The words of the prophets are what the Hebrew Scriptures teach. Why does the devil not want the church to study the Hebrew Scriptures? The Older Testament, when people hear Old Testament, they think irrelevant. 
It's the foundation of your faith. It's the Bible Jesus had. It's the Bible Paul had. When Paul said, study the scriptures to show yourself approved, a workman being a being equipped in righteousness, he was talking about the Hebrew Bible because the New Testament hadn't been written yet. He was in the process of writing most of it. Do you understand what I'm saying to you? The Bible of Jesus, the Bible of Paul is the Old Testament, as we call it. So Peter, excuse me, the devil hearing Peter preaching goes and says, oh, Jesus has to stay in heaven until the words of the prophets are fulfilled. I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to try and stop the words of the prophets from being fulfilled. Well, what did the prophets say? God said through the prophets, Israel, I'll make a covenant with you. Then, if you break my covenant, I'll scatter you to the nations, but I won't let you be destroyed. At the end of the age, I will bring you back. So the devil says, there it is. I know how to keep Jesus from returning. I'll kill the Jews. Or, I'll assimilate them. I'll put so much pressure on them and force them to assimilate culturally into the nations that they're scattered that they will no longer identify as Jews. So when God, in the end of the age, looks for Jewish people, He won't find any because they'll be so assimilated into Catholicism. They'll be so assimilated into Protestantism. They'll be so assimilated into one culture or another that after three or four or five or ten generations, they're no longer identified as Jews. They don't even know that they're Jewish. And we're discovering now how many people are discovering that they have Jewish DNA, that their family hid it, their family changed their name, their family, well, because they were afraid of the persecution. So they didn't know they were Jews. They didn't identify as Jews. They didn't practice any kind of Judaism. And um, that was part of Satan's plan. Well, if I can't kill them all, I'll just assimilate them all. That's what he's tried to do. But God never let that happen. He always had a remnant. He always had a Jewish nation. He's always going to have a Jewish nation. And he's going because the, they are indestructible. They are our eternal covenants. God has not broken his covenant with the Jewish people. Do you understand yeah, that? Yeah, yeah. If, he can break, if he broke his covenant with the Jewish people, what makes you think he'll break his covenant, not break his covenant with you? Because if you look down your snooty nose at the Jewish people for their sins, you need to look around at the state of the body of Christ and cry out in repentance for all the sin and hypocrisy that's alive and active in the church of the Lord Jesus and all over the world. The division, the separation, the vilification of one another. Oh, I mean, would you guys, don't get me started on that. That's a two-hour message. So, one of the reasons, in fact, in my opinion, the primary reason, Satan hates the Jews. It's not because they're Jews. It's because God has made a decision to use these people as a vehicle for the return of their king. And to fulfill what is written in the pages of Scripture. That's why the devil hates the Bible. That's why he wants to close the Bible in the minds and hearts of so many people. That's why so many churches no longer believe the Bible. They believe all kinds of theology, its ideologies, philosophies, etc. about why the Bible is not the Word of God, it's a collection of ancient myths, it's an anachronistic book, it's a primitive book, we don't believe that, we have psychology. Yeah. Or whatever ologies they might particularly have. And the devil says, that's right, don't believe the Bible, don't, believe, don't read that book. Close it up, shut, shut it down, put it in the closet, put it, in the bookshelf, put it in the library, that's right, don't read it, don't read it, don't read it. Because in the pages of the scripture are the revelation of the plan of God to return Jesus to the earth, which means Satan's demise. Yeah, right. Which is why he wants to fight the knowledge of the Bible. Which is why he wants to fight the gifts of the Spirit. He doesn't want you moving in the loving power of God. And he doesn't want you understanding God's prophetic purposes written in the pages of the Scripture. And what the prophets have said. Because what God said through the prophets must be fulfilled. And then when they're fulfilled, Jesus will return. We'll continue talking about this in our evening session. Let's pray. Father, I thank you. You're able to make all grace abound to all of us. I thank you that you're able to bring revelation to each of us of the biblical relationship and responsibility of the church to the Jewish people and the gifts and callings and anointings that are resonant in your people because they are gifts of the Holy Spirit. And I pray that your church will rise up in love and power to be able to provoke natural Israel to spiritual jealousy. And I pray for all of these who are here today and the ministers who've been speaking today, that they would be encouraged strongly in their ministries and their giftings to go forward, to pray and believe, and to, for you to show them strategies for how they can touch lives everywhere. 
using the technology that we have today and, and, and recording things and preaching and teaching and opening their homes and going wherever, Lord, you send them to the highways and byways, locally, nationally, internationally, to touch hungry lives everywhere. So, Lord, encourage your servants today in the name of Yeshua the Messiah, Jesus the Messiah. Amen and amen. Amen. Praise